Hello, and welcome to the first of our uh, video lecture presentations. Today, I will be talking about uh, David Hume. We will say a little bit about um, George Barclay by way of review, and then we will do some review of Hume and move on to some features of Hume um, in addition to what we covered last time. So, by way of announcement, there is no no class this week until Friday, and I will meet with you in person again on Friday, at which time we, we will be talking about Immanuel Kant. This is the first uh, video installment um, to replace the days that we are missing this week, and there is a second one um, that will be available in um, a day or so. So, um, again, by way of reminder, we will have the same kind of arrangement um, a little bit at the end of next month, at the end of, of March. So, last time we met, a long time ago, before our big, long President Day, President's Day adventure, uh, we were talking about George Barclay, and we had finished with Barclay, and we had talked about, begun talking about um, David Hume. I want to go back and review just a little bit of uh, information on Barclay today. Now, in addition to um, this lecture, there is a set of notes, and I have made these notes quite extensive and detailed so that, um, because we don't have the same kind of interaction um, that we have in an in an in class in our, uh, in class lecture, and so I am I'm going to make those notes fairly detailed. There is also available a PowerPoint presentation that also accompanies this um, this lecture. So I it may be the case that you can you can actually watch the PowerPoint presentation at the same time that um, you are listening to the lecture. Um, maybe you can just put the the audio on and you don't have to see my talking head um, and you can go through the um, through the PowerPoint presentation with the audio in the background um, and have the the notes available so if you are in the PowerPoint presentation the first slide is one that says February 19th or 19 February 2013 that lecture is um, that is, it is the lecture for that day. Um, go to the next, go to the next slide, and the next slide is actually a picture of George Barclay. And that brings us to a little bit of review material from, um, on George Barclay. So last time we had, um, we had finished with Barclay's immaterialism. And we had gone over in a fairly rapid fashion his arguments for why he thinks that there is um, no material world, why he thinks that the, the, the real world is the world of ideas and perceptions. And his strategy is a two-pronged strategy. So we should really emphasize this. His overall argument is a kind of nexus or connection of various arguments. His argument is what we would refer to as an eliminative argument. He is going to try to put together all the possibilities, and then he is going to eliminate all the other possibilities by art logical argumentation until he achieves the one that he thinks is the one that is the best um, opportunity for explanation. So his, his first premise in his long eliminative argument is something like this. Um, either perception is best understood in terms of uh, direct realism, or it is best understood in terms of representational realism, or it is best understood in terms of the immaterial idealism that I am offering. Um, then he goes through and he eliminates direct realism, and he's going to give two arguments why we should think that um, direct real realism is not true. And then he goes through and he eliminates representational realism. And given that the only other option that he sees in town is his view of um, immaterial 
idealism, he thinks that that is the best, um, the best approach. So that is his overall um, argumentative strategy. Now, his first argument we covered two sessions ago, and that is the, conceivabil the conceivability argument. And you should be familiar with that. So let's see, what's our next slide? We have a slide of direct realism. And I think that there's another, the next slide after that. So this is just a representation of what direct realism is. Remember that direct realism is the perceptual uh, theory that we can, in some way or another, get hold of directly the objects of perceptions. When, when we are perceiving a table, we are actually perceiving directly in the world that table without any kind of intervention between us and that table uh, of perceptual um, distortions or interventions or whatever you want to say. Now, direct realism is the view that there are no such uh, just, um, mediations. Representational realism is the idea that while there are indeed external objects, there are mediations between our minds and those um, and those actual objects and these mediations are the ideas and those are the two views that um, that Barclay is seeking to eliminate so um, the next slide on direct realism then gives us a, a kind of representation of what direct realism is supposed to be and then the next slide gives us his argument against um, direct real realism. There are actually two arguments against direct realism. This is the first one. So this is how that one goes. One, pains and pleasures exist only in minds. Two, all degrees of heat are equally real. Three, the most intense heat is a very great pain. Four, by one and three, the most Intense heat can only exist in a perceiving mind, um, and five, therefore, by four and two, all degrees of heat exist only in perceiving minds. So that is his first argument. Make sure that you understand this argument. Um, it's not enough to simply be able to memorize it. You need to understand the inferential steps. So you, you really need to be able to um, discern what the, the, the steps of reasoning are that he is taking. The next slide um, is entitled Argument from Perceptual Reality, and you'll remember that this slide has a, um, a double picture, and at the top of the double picture is a um, representation of a painting by, by Van Gogh, and then in the bottom picture there is a photograph of the exact area that, and the exact perspective that um, Van Gogh is using when he is looking down this path and painting this picture. And we get a kind of feeling that perception really does differ in some ways. Um, if you go to the next slide, it gives the argument from um, perceptual relativity against uh, direct realism that, that Barclay uses. And this is how that argument goes. One, under certain conditions, an object may appear to be different colors at or shapes at the same time. Two, but an object cannot be two different colors, that is, it cannot be red and blue all over, or two different shapes, circular and elliptical, at the same time. Three, so, by one and two, the sensible qualities of which I am directly aware are not the objects. Four, Therefore, the object of direct awareness, colored in shape, surfaces, etc., must be something mental. And again, both of these arguments are supposed to be supporting the idea that at very least, we are not encountering the, the external world without any kind of mental intervention. Um, somehow the mind seems to be, based on these two arguments, Inter intervening between us and the external world. And what Barclay is suggesting at this point is
Sorry, something popped up on the screen during recording. Um, what Barclay is suggesting at this point is that his arguments are suggesting to us that um, there is something wrong with the view of direct realism. So he is now thinking he can eliminate the direct realism um, option in his eliminative argument. Bring up the next slide, and that one is about representational realism. And we've seen this slide before. It's the slide with the person with the very large head who has a representational idea in that very large head of something that is in the external world, namely a candle. So the candle exists in the external world, and it is, and it is also represented as an idea in the person's head. Um, there is also, bring up the next slide, there is also um, something about primary and secondary qualities. Now remember, to defeat the representational realist, Barclay is going to drive home the idea that there is something fishy about this notion of primary and secondary qualities. What he's suggesting is that, in fact, the only qualities that we really know are the qualities that are the secondary qualities, and that we somehow think that Locke says we somehow know that these prod that these um, that these external objects um, exist in um, some way beyond our ability to perceive them through um, our secondary um, impulses. Bring up the next slide. But this brings us to the difficult and thorny problem of the veil of perception. And Barclay is trying to play on the veil of perception now against the um, representational realist. So the representational realist is going to suggest, yes, it is true that when we reflect upon our, um, our internal perceptual experience, it looks like our perceptions are different from the way that we think that the objects are. And now Barclay says, yes, but all we really know are those secondary qualities um, that we think belong to some um, external object, but we can't ever be sure that there is any such external object that is causing us to have this, these ideas. In fact, Barclay is going to argue that no material object can in fact cause the idea, um, can cause any idea uh, in us. They are not the right kind of thing to cause us to be able to, um, to have an idea. And that means that what he thinks is we need some kind of, a, of other explanation. And his explanation is that, in fact, there is no um, external world that is causing us these to um, have these perceptions. There's no objective, there's no world of external objects in the way that we routinely think that there is. Rather, he is going to make an argument that the cause of our perceptions is God. And he's going to give an argument for why God is the kind of being who really could cause us to have um, mental perceptions. And given that, he is going to use that as a proof for the existence of God. So that all that is by way of review of Bar uh, Barclay. And that brings us to Hume. And now we're going to begin um, reviewing Hume, and we're going to expand on what we had talked about um, last time with respect to Hume. So the next slide is... Um, a picture of David Hume, this picture, this painting of David Hume is in his military regalia. Um, he was the, uh, the judge advocate general for General St. Clair's um, adventure when he raids the coast of France during an, um, during a, an episode of the War of Austrian Succession. So, Hume has a kind of uh, adjunct military persona that he um, holds during this during this war. Um, go to the next slide. The next slide uh, is labeled naive realism, and that is how we sometimes characterize uh, direct realism. Now, Hume is going to suggest that, uh, like Barclay, there are really just two games in town. One is naive realism, and Hume refers to this as vulgar realism. Um, that is the 
kind of idea about perception of the external world that people have before they begin to think philosophically about their perceptions. And um, he thinks that, in fact, go to the next slide, there is, there is an, another um, slide of naive realism, and this is one in which a kind of brain captures somehow um, a house and encapsulate it, encapsulates it as part of its perception. Hume thinks that as soon as we begin to have any philosophical reflection on our own perceptions, we must say that there is something wrong with naive realism. And in fact, I think that Hume is very much going to suggest that the arguments from Berkeley are leading us in the right um, direction. There is something that, philo that philosophy has to offer that suggests that the common sense view about our perceptions is mistaken. Go to the next slide. The next slide is about representational realism. Hume also thinks with Berkeley that representational realism is another thing that needs to be eliminated. Hume thinks that that um, representational realism is in fact even worse than direct realism. And here's why. He thinks that it depends for its truthfulness um, on direct realism, but absurdly tries to undermine direct realism. Um, as a result, he says, it is a monstrous offspring of direct realism. So he thinks that there is something wrong with both the view of direct realism and the philosophical alternative to the view of direct realism, namely representational realism. And Hume insists these are the only two games in town. It's These are the only real theories that we have available to us. He is not taking seriously the idea uh, from Berkeley that it is God that is causing our perceptions. So that would seem that um, Hume leaves us in a complete quandary with respect to perception. But I think that actually what he thinks is that we just don't have the, um, the mental capacity to get to the bottom of what our uh, perceptions are actually um, like. He, he doesn't think that we have enough power in our reasoning to come to fully understand and explain our perceptions. So, where does that leave us then? That leaves us in a position that is referred to as naturalism. Hume suggests that even though upon philosophical reflection we will decide that direct realism cannot really be the right kind of explanation of our perceptions, in spite of that we are naturally designed in such a way that we are going to um, Upon philosophical reflection, even, we're going to reject the two worldview, um, the double worldview, as, as Hume calls it, of representational realism. And while we're philosophically re reflecting on things, we might think that our perceptions have nothing to do with the external world in a kind of massive skepticism like what um, what Barclay is suggesting. Or we might think of our perceptions as being a double representation, uh, a double presentation of the world. But in fact, what Hume says is, when we're not philosophically reflecting, we're going to treat our perceptions in very much the same way as the vulgar do. And that's because nature is too strong for us. Our... Um, our own natures make it so that, in fact, what we are going to do is fully accept the um, with confidence when we are not philosophically reflecting that, in fact, what we are perceiving are the very things themselves. And <clears throat> we're going to do this with a philosophical sophistication. We have rejected direct realism. We've rejected um representational realism, and those are the only two games in town, what we're going to do is we're going to go back with full philosophical understanding now and accept that the best that we can do is act as if um, representation, or sorry, as if direct realism um, were true. 
Hume can be thought of then as a dialectical thinker. We have a thesis in a, in a dialectical operation. We have a thesis. Then we have a contradictory antithesis. antithesis. And then um, we have a kind of uh, combining so in some way or other synthesis. Three, three separate stages. So you might think of direct realism as offering a thesis and representational realism as offering a, um, an antithesis to direct realism. What then is the, uh, the synthesis? Well, the synthesis we might think is some kind of a combination of direct realism and representational realism, but that's not how we get in, get it in Hume. In Hume, what it actually is, is a philosophical return to um, acting as if, in fact, direct realism were true. Okay, go to the next slide. The next slide is entitled um, Hume on I Hume Ideas and Impressions. And remember that, that Hume takes the perceptual world of his predecessors, the world of ideas that he had picked up from um, from Berkeley and from Locke and from, from Descartes. And remember that those guys are all referring to ideas in general as the perceptions that are entertained by our mind. Hume is going to make a distinction. The broad category for Hume is perception, and it will split into two categories. The first category is the, the category of those perceptions that are, in Hume's words, first appearances in the soul. They are lively. They are vivacious. They are forceful. Um, they are the direct sense impressions that we have. And then there are, and, and after we have these, and they are no longer before our mind, the mind takes a kind of copy of these. But it's an incomplete or insufficient copy. It's a copy that a copy machine would make if it doesn't have enough ink in it. Um, and so we might have a, a document and we see it with perfect clarity and then we make a copy of it on our copy machine and our copy machine doesn't have enough ink. And so we get a, a, a kind of ghostly simulacra copy of the, uh, the original document. Our ideas are those kinds of copies of our impressions. So we might have a direct impression of something right in front of us, um, the table or the computer or whatever. And then we, we turn our attention away from that and then back to it. But we don't now have a direct perception of whatever it was that was formerly directly in front of us. Now instead we have an idea of what that was. In fact, the idea is a memory of what that was that was directly in front of us before. And it is a kind of ghostly copy of the direct perception that we had previously had. Okay, we had gone over last time Hume's really um, famous argument about how cause and effect is not supposed to be based on reason by his um, line of argumentation. And that that is something that we want to go over in, in greater detail. So go to the next slide, and the next slide is on Hume's fork. And remember that Hume's fork has a reference to a kind of argumentative strategy that Hume often uses. And that is um, a strategy that is designed to show that um, the things that we think are possibly based on reason are not in fact based on reason. And here's why. Reason is constituted of one of two things, each of, what, each of which satisfies one prong on the fork. So Hume's fork is the fork of reason. On one prong of the fork are what we had referred to as ROIs, that is, relations of ideas. This, involved, this includes um, math truths and logic truths. They are thought to be true by Hume in relation to other ideas and to nothing else. And they are going to be true independently of whether or not there is somebody to perceive them, um, Hume says. 
It is going to be the case that the laws that govern triangles are going to be true, even if there is nobody in the world to perceive those triangles. And Hume's going to go far enough as to say 2 plus 2 is going to equal 4 independently of anybody's perceiving that um, anything about 2 plus 2 um, equaling 4. So Hume is going to say one kind of way in which we can be assured uh, that something is based on reason if it is one of these kinds of truths. ROIs, it is important to realize, are governed by a specific principle, and that principle is the law of contradiction. And would I say that these ROIs are governed by that principle? What I mean is the conditions under which a proposition that is an ROI um, is going to be true is going to be governed in accord with the law of contradiction. And I'll say a little bit more about what that means um, directly. The other prong of the fork is the MOF, matters of fact. And it's important to realize by matters of fact, he is really going to limit those to what are directly before our minds as perceptions. They have to be immediately in front of our minds. That is, right now, they have to be right before our minds. <coughs> If, remember, they were formerly before our minds, but now are not, well, the mind has moved on. It is now perceiving something else directly, and what <coughs> had formerly been before our mind has, as an impression, has now become um, an idea. And that has a different kind of um, arrangement than what we had um, said with impressions. Okay. So, go to the next slide, and the next slide brings up um, Hume's argument, and this is the argument that cause and effect belief is not based on reason. <coughs> it is four lines long. Premise one is the longest of these lines, and it's the one that Hume thinks is most secure. It says this, and, and really he's not going to give us an argument for premise one. <clears throat> if belief in cause and effect, and we had labeled this C and E, if belief in cause and effect is based on reason, then it is either a relation of ideas, that is, an ROI, or a matter of fact, that is, an MOF. And then on the slide, it gives the, um, the symbolic representation of that sentence. Premise two. Cause and effect belief is not based on, uh, on ROIs. Premise three, cause and effect belief is not an MOF. Um, and then four, our conclusion. Therefore, cause and effect belief is not based on reason. And that is a valid form. That argument can be quickly shown to be, uh, to have a valid structure. Now we want to know whether or not the premises are true. We want to know if it is also, in addition to being a valid argument, if it is also a sound argument. So in order for us to make an assessment, we might think that there is something wrong with premise two and with premise three. We might object to the claim that cause and effect belief is not based on relations of ideas. Or we might object to the claim that cause and effect belief is not based on matters of fact, and Hume has to address that. So he is going to try to support premise two and premise three of this main argument against cause and effect. And in order to support those premises, what he really needs to do is give us a separate argument that is going to achieve that line of this argument as a conclusion. So in other words, we have a kind of branching of arguments. We have this argument um, against cause and effect being based on um, reason. We have this as our main argument, and then we have additional arguments that are going to achieve um, premises two and three as conclusions to their reasoning. So we need to know what his support is for premise two. And he gives us this argument. 
um, remember that this is this argument is about relations of ideas. And the next slide, uh, the next two slides actually show us um, some conceptions of relations of ideas. So the first one is of uh, geometrical relations. And if you go to the next slide, the next slide is of a mapping of two sets of numbers onto each other. And we can see um, that these are, the numbers themselves are ideas, and the mapping counts as a kind of relation among these ideas. Okay, and now go to the next slide, and that gives us his actual argument <coughs> in support of premise two. And here's how that argument goes. And this argument is um, lettered rather than numbered. So let's go through it. And it is going to be, let's see how many lines long, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, lines A through H. And H will be our final um, conclusion to this argument. So here's how it goes. A, ROIs depend for their truth on the law of contradiction. Thus, and then there is a little piece of logic and math combined there. Um, there's a sentence, and it has a little squiggly, and then it has um, in parentheses the sentence 2 plus 2 equals 4. And that is the negation of the sentence that is inside of the parentheses. So when we put the little squiggly not symbol outside of those parentheses, what it means is we're negating. We're we're saying we're going to accept a different value than true for this particular sentence. So the way that we read that sentence with its symbology is, it is not the case that 2 plus 2 equals 4. And what this premise says, premise, says, uh, premise A says um, at the last, is that this um, involves a contradiction. This negated sentence of a math truth that we know, when we negate it, we somehow introduce contradiction to um, our operation. Premise B. Hume thinks that contradictory utterances are unintelligible. One way that you can tell uh, if a math truth is true is it makes sense. And everything else is somehow unintelligible. And all contradictions are supposed to be, for Hume, in some way, just nonsensical. They, they don't make any sense. They are unintelligible. So that's premise B. Premise C. And this is a reductio step. So we're going to make a supposition. Remember, when the philosopher makes a supposition, he is not supposing that. Um, so that we will end up thinking that that is the true answer. The supposition step is there to show that when we suppose this, it leads us to a contradiction. So suppose a cause and effect statement, say, and then in quotes, the sun will rise tomorrow. That's the, supposed to be a cause and effect statement. Suppose that to be an ROI. Go to the next premise, premise D. Then by A and B, and then now we're going to take that sentence that we had just seen in premise C, namely the, the sun will um, rise tomorrow. And I, it looks like I've made a, a mistake on this slide. And you should move the, parenth the closing parentheses um, so that it closes after the word tomorrow. Um, we're going to take the, the sentence that had been um, identified as a causal sentence in premise C. The sun will come up tomorrow. We're going to bracket that in parentheses, and we're going to put a negation symbol um, in front of it. And if cause and effect belief is, since this is supposed to be a kind of cause and effect uh, proposition, if cause and effect belief is based on, um, on ROIs, then this negation will involve a contradiction. And if it involves a contradiction, then the negation of what we had just said will be unintelligible. So let's move now to uh, premise E. But, and then in quotes, the sun will not rise tomorrow 
is not unintelligible. It may we might not think it's true, but we're we we don't fail to understand what it means when somebody says to us, um, "The sun will not rise tomorrow." However, we would fail to understand what somebody was really meaning if they came up to us and said, "Two plus two is seventy-two." We would not understand what they were what they were trying to make to um, say, um, and that's. Uh, that seems to indicate that these kinds of sentences are of different types, um, that they are governed in their truth conditions by some kind of a different principle. So go to the next premise, premise F. Therefore, the negation of D is not a contradiction. If it were a contradiction, that sentence, that negated sentence, would be unintelligible. Go to premise G. But by A, premise A, ROIs depend for their truth value on the law of contradiction. And so our final conclusion is, therefore, cause and effect belief is not an ROI, and premise 2 of Hume's argument against cause and effect belief not being based on, our, on reason is, in fact, supported. So that is his support for premise 2. It basically says this. Um, when we have cause and effect statements, the negation of them does not lead to a contradiction. And we know this because the negation of them is not made, um, is, it does not involve us in something that is meaningless or nonsense or unintelligible. They make perfectly good sense. They may be false, but nevertheless, we are able to say that they make sense. And so when we say that they are false, it must be the case that we are assigning that value of false to those kinds of sentences for some other kind of reason than when we say that 2 plus 2 equals 72 is false. The, the rules that govern their truth are of different types. And so Hume is now able to say, look, cause and effect is not like math, so we're going to have to give some other kind of understanding of it. So go to the next slide. And it is the negation of relations of ideas. And so that seems to support Hume in his, posi in his position in um, premise two of his main argument against cause and effect being based on reason. Go to the next slide. The next slide is entitled MOFs, Matters of Fact. And remember, again, that matters of fact are those perceptions that are immediately before the mind um, that are right immediate to us. So Hume thinks that it is true that there is, say, a table in front of me. And if I don't want to stub my thigh into it, which will likely cause me a great deal of pain, um, I should steer myself around it. But as long as it is directly um, in front of me, I can use that as a measure of truth. So, one idea is that our our notion, our belief that cause and effect is based on our cause and effect belief is based on reason. Um, the basis for thinking that is um, that we are able to take in cause and effect relations through sense experience as matters of fact. But Hume is now giving an argument in support of premise three, which is to say that cause and effect belief is not based on um, MOFs, matters of fact. And here's how that, go to the next slide, and that argument is contained in the next slide. And here's how that one goes again. It is a lettered argument, and it is lettered A through D this time. And premise A says this, if cause and effect belief is an MOF, then the whole relation of cause and effect must be immediately present to the senses. We can't have part of the relation of cause and effect becoming an idea. Because remember, if it becomes an idea, uh, the relations of ideas are going to be governed by a separate principle. And what Hume sa is saying is, and we already know, 
that those are not um, that that's not the true way of understanding um, cause and effect belief. Cause and effect belief is not again based on ROIs. Okay, so we're just we're just going to concentrate at this point on MOFs. And if we think that cause and effect belief is uh, a matter of fact, what we need to be able to say is that the whole entire relation of a cause and effect uh, situation is simultaneously before our mind as an immediately present perception. And that's what is claimed in premise A of his supporting argument. So go to premise B, B. But cause and effect as a relation is not revealed to the senses. Well, why should we think that? When I see a, a car wreck, I know very well that, in fact, there has been, um, I've seen, I, I saw the wreck. I know that there was a causal relation and that I saw this. And what Hume is suggesting is, if you concentrate only on what you actually saw and don't let your ideas intervene on what you are immediately perceiving, that you will realize that, in fact, um, what you've seen is an antecedent event. Hume refers to them as objects of awareness or perception. You've seen an antecedent object of perception, and you've seen a consequent um perception of an object of awareness or an event. And what somehow happened is you have imposed a relation that is not taken in through the senses itself onto what you're actually seeing. Um, we always see the causal event um, followed by the effective event, Hume thinks. And we do not see this relation um, that ties them together. In fact, um, Descartes himself refers to these sorts of relations as, uh, as uh, occult forces. And he will not allow, uh, it, all except for one of the occult forces, he will not allow into his scientific understanding. Because Descartes turns out to be a pretty hard-nosed empiricist. He's not going to, once the senses are back in, because um, God is, uh, God exists, and he is no deceiver, once the senses are back in, uh, Descartes is going to say, we're going to stick with empiricism pretty rigidly in um, bringing out a scientific investigation. And we're not going to allow stuff that is that goes beyond our senses. What Descartes suggests is that there are all kinds of um, forces that we hypothesize, occult forces, because they are not capturable by our sense experience. We do not see these forces. And Hume is suggesting that cause and effect is one of these kinds of occult forces. Um, and Let's, let's say a little bit more about that. Go to the, go to the next slide. So one thing that we might say is that cause and effect is like the daughter and mother, the mother daughter relation. And we've got such a relation, um, illustrated in the next slide. There is in the slide, um, at the beach, apparently, uh, a woman. And this woman is holding in her arms a small girl. And I can see the woman, and I can see the small girl. And what I can't actually see is the relation of mother-daughter that is, that, that binds these two together. That is something that is, that goes beyond, um, what is available to the senses. Okay. And here's another illustration to try to, um, get a handle on this, this difficult idea. Um, go to the next slide. And this next slide is entitled Momentum Transfer. And Momentum Transfer uh, has a young man who is hitting a cue ball with a cue stick, and it, it, it goes into motion, and it crashes into another billiard ball, and that second billiard ball 
goes into motion. Now, what is the story that we tell ourselves about um, these billiard balls? Well, um, you see the first billiard ball and it's in motion, says Hume anyway, and then you see the sec you see the collision, and then you see the second billiard ball go into motion, and you say that there has been a relation of cause and effect that has somehow bound these two things together. Now, when the first billiard ball is in motion, what we say is that it has an unseen quality, namely, it has momentum. And then it collides with the resting uh, billiard ball, and as it collides, there is a transfer of this unseen entity, the momentum of the first billiard ball, and it is transferred to the second ball, and so the second ball now, with that momentum, goes into motion. Um, the problem is, of course, that the, the transfer is unseen, and it couldn't be seen for a very good reason, and that is, it is the transfer of an unseen quality from one thing um, to another. Hume is suggesting that our ideas of cause and effect begin to impinge on our on our perceptions. We're not paying close enough attention to what we are actually perceiving. If we paid enough attention to what we are actually perceiving, what we would realize is that we just see one billiard ball in motion, we see a collision, and then we see another billiard ball in motion, but we do not see um, at any point the relation of cause and effect that ties these two events together. So go to the next slide. That, of course, means that uh, cause and effect belief is not based on an MOF. MOFs are out. But if ROIs are out, and now with a separate line of reasoning, MOFs are, right, are, are out, that means that Hume has secured his position with respect to the um, the argument. It looks like it was valid, but now Hume has made a very strong case for the idea that his argument, in addition to, be, to being valid, is also sound. Now, that should not sit very well with, with you. Um, we really do want to, in some way, say that the universe is organized of cause and effect relationships, and that the discovery of these relationships is one of the hallmarks of of reasoning. So go to the next slide. The next slide has this conclusion. Therefore, cause and effect belief is not based on reason. Go still to the next slide. And this slide has a picture of Bertrand Russell on it. And Russell is uh, Russell is an English philosopher. And um, what Russell tells us is that there is a special place a special chamber in hell that is reserved for all those philosophers and people who want to attempt to refute David Hume on this, um, this thorny difficulty. Um, and there are many people in that special chamber of, of hell. Uh, go to the, ne the next slide and it actually shows a, a chamber of hell specially reserved for those people who try to refute David Hume on the issue of cause and effect uh, belief being based on reason. Um, it looks like this uh, this lecture is coming up on um, a 50 minute lecture, so I think that I'll stop there um, by just saying this: that the next time that um, we talk, I will give what Hume thinks is is his solution to the very skeptical results that he has just presented. And, he, and those results will be somewhat famous. Um, Hume essentially is inventing the, the notion of classical conditioning. And I will all add that to the next lecture. So we're going to stop at that point, um, at this point, and I will come back to that in the next lecture. And then I will move on to Hume's moral theory briefly, and then I want to talk about Adam Smith and Thomas Reed. And then again on Friday, I will um, I will 
meet with you again, and we will talk about the philosophy of Immanuel Kant. It's important to realize that Kant thinks he has a solution to the difficulty that Hume is presenting. And I would have to say that what Kant is going to do is he's going to make an argument for the idea that Hume's first premise is somehow incomplete, that there is something in addition to um, pure reason and something in addition to um, matters of fact. And this is the basis for his famous need for this, com this concept of the synthetic a priori. And the synthetic a priori seems to provide a kind of solution to the notion of, uh, the, to the skeptical difficulties that David Hume has um, left us with. Kant believes that Hume has left us with a scandal in philosophy. And we will come to that um, on Friday. All right. Thank you very much. Bye.